Hi everyone, Scott with Dearly Departed here. Today's vlog is about Heidi. Who's Heidi, you may ask? Well, the Heidi I'm talking about today is Heidi Fleiss. Now, Heidi Fleiss is known as the Hollywood Madam. Heidi is spent time in prison for such work, and, uh, and uh, Heidi is a very interesting person. Now, uh, Heidi used to have a series of, oh, look at this, this is autographed. Thank you, Heidi Fleiss. Heidi had uh, a few shops, clothing shops, Heidi Wear, it was called. Uh, one was on Hollywood Boulevard, one was in Santa Monica, and uh, one was in Pasadena. And it's interesting is that the one on Hollywood Boulevard still, uh, the shop is obviously closed. It's been closed for decades probably by now. But uh, the security door in front of it still says Heidi Fleiss on it, or Heidi Wear, or Hollywood Madam. That was the name of her shop. This is a book that she wrote called The Player's Handbook, which is sort of dating advice and how to, uh, well, how to date and uh, a particular type of dating, which I think is, is uh, uh, I love that. Uh, just how to impress a man if you like that that's what you want to do. I mean, you know, it's, as she said, looks are only a head start. You don't have to be classically beautiful to get the man you want. An average looking woman is confident, happy, and slightly reserved. It's more appealing to a man than a dumb girl with a nice ass. From the words of Heidi Fleiss. This is actually funny. My, my old lunch pail, my old lunch cooler from when I used to work at um, another tour company many, many, many years ago. And uh, I covered it with old stickers and, uh, and uh, things that were important to me <laughs> at the time that made me laugh. And, uh, and actually I do have a, the sticker that I put on it back in the day. And it, passing that shop on Hollywood Boulevard and seeing that security door prompted me to reach out to Heidi Fleiss. And I found her uh, when on her charity, not charity, but uh, she, she is active in, uh, in helping macaws, parrots. And I found her online at her website and I reached out and, uh, and she agreed to talk to me. Today's vlog is an audio conversation with Heidi Fleiss. And she was great. I love talking to her. Okay, hang on. Here it goes. Hi, Heidi. This is Scott Michaels. Hey, Scott. Thanks a lot for uh, for taking a few minutes to speak with me today. I appreciate it. Sure. Um, are you are you okay with me recording this and uh, and? Sure. Okay, cool. I appreciate it. Uh, so I, I just want to ask you so a couple of questions. So you started a tour line? What, what's your deal? Say that again? You started a tour line? Your, that, that's your tour line? Yeah, my, my own tour departed. company is called it's called Dearly Departed Tours. That's right. And you and took it by what, dead, dead famous people's houses? Right. Yeah. It's, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> the one that uh, that I'm really well known for now is the uh, the Helter Skelter tour uh, about the Tay LaBianca murders and uh, oh, in Los so, Angeles. That's in right. Yeah. yeah, and Benedict. I mean, we, it's about a 45 mile drive, and we cover, you know, where where the evidence was found and where it was ditched and where you know J C. bring the, the his and hair also, salon and was. You want to probably see the O J Simpson and the Menendez too. Yeah, they yeah, there's certainly an interest for that sort of that that stuff too. Those were the biggies, most definitely. So, um, for but sure. yeah, we yeah, that, I could I could see people really being interested in all, seeing all that, you know. Well, I mean, you were at the at the beginning of all this with the with the Menendez brothers and the Beverly Hills, the fascination with all that and sure, the trials sure. becoming so public. So, um, although this this type of work, tourism wise, has been around since the '80s, uh, like about '87, I think, is when it started with a different company called Graveline, and uh, and they used old Cadillac hearses back then. But Graveline went under, and I uh, and I started mine about 16 years ago, and then I I also move into the uh, the interviews on YouTube and stuff like that too. So uh, and that's <laughs> now that uh, the, my my job is sort of in the uh, in the in the crapper because of the COVID thing. I that's just how I, I you know make my living now is doing interviews and putting up on YouTube and at least covering my rent that way. So that's that's how this came about. But uh, someone that, that was one of the people who's become a really good friend of mine, and and I don't know why I'm telling you this because I guess maybe <laughs> my friend, her name was Virginia Graham, and she was a, you know, quote, a party girl in the 70s. 
60s, and she's the one uh, who busted the Manson case in prison when one of the killers confessed to her. And, uh, oh, and she was, one of the girls. Yeah, I mean, right. I, I read I read Bugliosi's book. The you know the okay. Were you read, were you that's that, that's the, the you know he's the prosecutor. Yeah, 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 definitely. Did you Sometimes. did you grow up in in the Silver Lake area? I grew up in Montfield. Did you go to Marshall up, High? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Oh, and Immaculate and, Heart. Oh really? Oh when so did you yeah. graduate from Immaculate Heart? I, I didn't graduate I did I left like, in the in the right beginning of tenth grade. I went for a couple a couple months in Immaculate Heart, a couple months at Marshall and I was done. Oh, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> you know, did, did you know that um that Meghan Markle graduated from there? Yeah, I think that's pretty cool. It is. It's interesting. I, I, I thought that was great that she went to Maxwell Heart. I think that's awesome, you know? A, neighbor, a neighborhood girl. Thing. So yeah. you grew up in L.A. too? No, I'm from Detroit. I, I, this is something I just found out recently. You were you were a chess champion in school? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then you, did you, you won awards? <laughs> yeah, I won city championship in L.A. and then in, uh, for 13 and 14, and then in prison I won big bags of junk food. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. I run tons of junk food. All the bags of junk food. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm curious about your. I mean, when you went to uh, when you were in prison, did I mean I don't know what that's like. I can't say I know what that's like. But the demonstration. I don't know if you watched that show, Orange Is the New Black. Was any of that? Did you ever see that? It was so real. It was so yeah. real. When I watched, uh, I didn't watch all of it, but the episodes I did watch, I felt like, did somebody read, uh, have a camera on me or a notebook? Like, it was so, it was like I lived everything they had going on in there. I was yeah, shocked how real it was. It was so real, all of it. So were you, were you scared? I yeah, I was really scared. <laughs> so I'm glad that uh, prison was a really important part of my life because it pretty much shaped who I am today. Did you, when you were in prison, did you, were you, because you were high profile, did they put you in a different sort of population? No, see, um, I was at the prison camp that same, I was just where Felicity Huffman was, right there. But okay. when I got there, they were like, it was famous for Patricia Hearst was there. I think her uh -huh. father probably built, built the place. You know, but um, when Patricia Hurst was there, it was made for single man cells. It was co-ed. It was like um, um, you could wear your own clothes, have food brought in. It was kind of like a nightclub when she was there. But it's nothing like that when I was there or nowadays. It's hardcore. Those single man cells now have five people in them, and it's. Um, a lot of stress and tension. If you're a lesbian, it's great. <laughs> it's really yeah, great. I can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and I had a girlfriend when I was there and stuff like that too. Though. So, but uh, because actually when I was, I remember I was looking, I was sitting on the aisle, I was looking, I was like, wow. I was like 30 days short. That means 30 days till I get up. At the end, I was like. Oh wow, they're kind of cute. And I was like, Oh my god, it's a girl. What am I doing? Oh my god, you know. <laughs> that kind of thing. You just get, you get you just get kind of used to caught up and used to what's going around you, and it just start all starts to seem normal. It's amazing how quickly that happens. I I can imagine. I mean, I, that is it's just it's like being in a I don't know maybe maybe in a supermarket with a certain type of food that you would normally eat, and eventually, you know, you're going to get <laughs> hungry hungry enough to eat. Yeah. It. <laughs> I mean, you got out. They did let you out early, right? No, I did my whole three years. <laughs> oh, oh. Okay. I did 36 months. I don't know why the media says I did 22 months because I did get out early. But then I was at a halfway house, and the counselor was – I was at some halfway house in downtown. It was kind of worse than prison because I really wanted to go home. I was so close to home and not be able to go home. But it was it was horrible, but it was so much easier for me to be in prison than be in the halfway house. Yeah. I get that. That makes complete sense. It would be heartbreaking, to, like you said, to be so close. And also you got yeah, you're, you're so on eggshells the whole time because you don't know what's going to yeah, happen. Yeah, it was so – it's so much worse. To, and when I was in prison, uh, my family came once, and Frank Sinatra Jr. came and saw me. Up, um, and then I, after that, I was like, cancel all my visits. Nobody visit me. 
and just let me do this because if someone comes to visit you, all it does is make you homesick and it just makes it so much harder, it's so much easier to just be present, stay in the moment, and then it's easy. Yeah. Having blinders on and no, yeah. I, I yeah, get just, and, yeah, and get into, you know, well, who's fighting in the cow hall, cow hall, what more detail, what, so just get into whatever's going on, it made it so much easier. When you got out of prison, well, I'm not curious, but I, I watched one, I watched that, uh, one of those movies that was done about you, uh, last week, and I just wondered if there was anything that, that you thought, or, you know, was now in retrospect like the best representation of what happened uh, to you or what you were uh, oh i think that guy nick broomfeld did an okay job you know yeah. it was done 30 years ago though you know yeah i was young i was you know i'm older old i'm 55 now or yeah 50, yeah 55 right now and um i think i did that interview when i was 25 or something mm -hmm. with Nick Broomfield. And um, that other one I did with uh, HBO, I was high out of my mind on drugs but from that day. So I didn't, can't even watch it because of that. It, it, when you when you were in uh, in the business, where where there's there was a somebody told me pointed out the building to me and said that's where Heidi Place's headquarters were. Where where were you based when you were working? When in you my had house. That? Where was Affinity that? Affinity Canyon. I bought my house from Michael Douglas. Oh okay, and that's where you were. That's where you were based out of at that point. Oh yeah. Well, look at. I knew this. Look, at, I had a lot of. I was making a lot of money then, and I, look, I could have saved money and had an apartment in the valley or something. But I knew buy a house so make my job really easy. That made it so when every girl came in, they would be like, "Oh my God, whatever she is doing, I want to do it because I want to live like this." So uh -huh, that's uh -huh. why. I, that's why I made sure that. My when people walked in, it just made everything. I was wasn't gonna make my job harder. That's for sure. <laughs> you know. Right. I made I made it really easy by li living like that. You know, I have a Ferrari, have you know, Porsche, Corvette, had everything. Well, had everything you, everything everybody thinks is good and fancy and all that stupid stuff that I can't stand right now. I had all that and did all that. <laughs> I mean, the turnaround time and the fact that you got that and lost that was freaking amazing. I mean, that was like my head. <laughs> Spins, thinking about that couple of years in there, where where I mean, it was like the amazing rise and fall. I mean, that was that was pretty. Well, you know what? The, the truth is that I had lasted more than four months was amazing because look, I really cornered that market. Every night I would have girls out all over the world, and then in the continental United States. But there's people who've been in the business and they're in their 50s and 60s, the pins, the madams, and what their whole life, and could not could not achieve what I achieved. So I had so many enemies. And then say when I would meet girls and they come to my house, I'd have to judge like, are they gonna you know give me my cut? Are they gonna out hustle me? Are they gonna be stealing someone's clothes? Or are they gonna be troublemakers? So I would. Say if I would ha wouldn't take a girl because I thought that she's going to be a troublemaker and rip me off and stuff, then she leaves my property. Like, oh my God, I would hate Heidi. I'm going to get Heidi. So I made so many enemies, mm -hmm. and these people really hated me. I made a lot of enemies really fast. So it's amazing that I lasted as long as I did. Did you back. ever fear? Did you ever fear for your life? Never. I've never ever had that problem. Oh, there's always the legend about you know the little black book. And I know your the fact that you've remained silent. I have a good kept... black book, I'll tell you that. It's just like <laughs> Jeffrey Epstein, except no um, pedophilia in there. <laughs> you you still have this book? No, no. The, 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 I've never come close. If everyone says I'm selling it or this, those are just rumors and stuff. Yeah. So what I really was interested, you got out in 98, uh, and no, I was no, curious. No, I left in I left in 97, and I got out in 2000. Oh, you were, okay, okay. Yeah, and then, I was gone during that whole internet boom. Well, you think you would have been better? You think you'd have done, uh, you think you'd have been more successful or uh, on the internet? Um, no, I don't know. It's that, uh, 
I think I would have transitioned from a madam into something else. I, I think I, I was, right before I got arrested, I did, I was trying to analyze my life because I knew I didn't want to be a madam forever. And it was right, you know, bring, bring down that wall, right when the wall came down. And mm -hmm. I knew I had enough connections and I was trying to put together a deal like, in Russia or stuff, they needed cigarettes and dress shoes, and I knew I had connections in Mexico and all these people to put it, something like that together where you can send a tanker of cigarettes or dress shoes over, and if you just get a little tiny percentage, it's a lot of money. So I was looking into transitioning, like looking, thinking about it right, you know, before I got arrested, I was thinking about changing to something else, you know? Yeah. Because they, I knew I would get, have a problem or something eventually, but I never thought it would success. Who's going to make such a big deal about it, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the Madam Alice, she was arrested 13 times. So I was like, big deal. I'll, if I do get in trouble, it'll probably happen. And now I'll just move into, I'll be something else, transfer into, transition to something else. But the way I got arrested and what came after it, it just catapulted me into something I was totally unprepared for, you know? It was for, I mean, you basically, it was not necessarily for uh, being a madam, but it was all, it was sort of getting rid of the money afterwards, wasn't it? I mean, that was, not, that was the big deal, wasn't well, it? Well, yes, but I, I went to jail for the, yeah, the money part, but, you know, it just, the, uh, the big deal it was made was the part that was weird. You know, that Madam Mouse was arrested 13 times and she wasn't in the news and all this kind of stuff. That yeah. The part when I was arrested that it was such a big deal was the part that kind of put me in a weird, you know, it screwed up my head a little bit. I was stupid and not prepared. You know, of course, hindsight's twenty twenty. but... And do you think somewhere in the records, like in all the transcripts or the evidence in your trial, that the, that all those names that you've been pretty, you've protected, are, are actually written down somewhere and, and uh, in somebody's, or somewhere in some, in some hall or file cabinet? I don't know whatever happened to it. I don't know it, yeah. but... I know who my clients were, and the people that saw, the people that worked with me know who my clients were. And I wouldn't have been hiding slice and living at large like I was if I wasn't dealing with, you know, the pe the one percent of the richest people in the world. Yeah, yeah. And how did you get into the to the clothing business? That's that's what I, you know. I think I sent you that picture of, of your shop that your name is still on that uh, on that that's security that. door. So well, that's why I wanted to how I how I got into the clothing is after I was arrested I knew I had to start do something that would occupy my time at why I was on trial and everything or else I'd end up getting arrested again. And then I would just have a I don't want to, that kind of problem stacking up. So I started selling the, you know, T-shirts and boxer shorts, like Juicy. It was like Juicy. So mm -hmm. I had a store on Third Street Promenade and one in Old Town is before I went to prison, is where I had my store. And before I went to prison, Calvin Klein even flew me out to the Hamptons and met with him and we were going to do a deal. But I was, you know, and he's talking about sobriety and I just talked to Perky Down. And I was on my way to prison. I couldn't even think about my selling a business or think, think that far ahead. But then, so I didn't do anything. But then afterwards, when I got out of to prison, that's when Juicy Couture sold their sweatshirt, their sweatpants and T-shirts and underwear for three hundred million. So what another fuck up I was. But okay, so then after prison, when I got out, I was dating that actor Tom Sizemore, and then when we broke up, I was living with that guy Jeff Green. He's um, he uh, like his house and. Beverly Hills is for sale for two hundred million. It has mm -hmm. a vineyard on it, and uh, I think he lives in Florida now. He he ran for senator or something like that. But I was living at Jeff Green's, and Jeff Green owned like four four of those buildings on Hollywood Boulevard. And he said, Heidi, how about if you have put it in their clothing store again on Hollywood Boulevard? I was like, hell no, Jeff. I don't ever want to run a store again. He goes, yeah, just do it. And he talked me into it. And I really didn't feel like doing it, but I just did it for the heck of it because he owned the building. 
I still had to pay him rent and all that. I think he ended up evicting me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you had the other shops first, then you went to prison, and then you opened the one on Hollywood Boulevard? Yeah. Yeah, that's okay. what happened. Yeah. And what what started, like, Heidi Ware? I mean, what made you think? Was it because of Juicy? Because you thought, well, no, it would have been before No, there that. wasn't Juicy. When I started, yeah. there was no Juicy. There was yeah. no Juicy. I don't know why I called it Heidi Ware. Someone else just told me to call it that. But look, I made a million dollars, $20 at a time. That was so hard to do before I went to prison, selling those T-shirts and underwear. You did. You, you sat there and you yeah. talked to everybody and you autographed everything. Yes, yes. And it was so much fun before I went to prison. I loved it, but it's not something I ever want to do again. Because yeah. there was a purpose why I had the store. It was really good. But then when I then I had did my book when I got out of prison, so when I Jeff was talking me into it, I thought, Oh, it'll be a good vehicle to also sell my book. Mm-hmm. And it was. My book, I published my book myself and did it myself, Pandering. And I, it, the book did really well. But when the whole book market, although it changed so much, it did really well because it was a $50 book. I think I printed 200,000, and then I have 25,000 copies left. So, And it was a $50 book, so that's a lot of books. But that's pretty damn good of a $50 book. No, that's amazing. Yeah, I give them for Christmas gifts, and people still buy them all the time. It's a cool book. I don't know if you ever saw it, but I'll send you a copy. I, you know, I'd love that. I, I think that'd be awesome. I was, um, the book that I was looking at was the player's handbook too. And, uh, no, pandering, and, is, pandering is the cool book. Pandering. Yeah. And is it, is really it, cool. was, was your, uh, was your, was, did you make up the, uh, the saying somebody somewhere is tired of seeing her? Oh uh, yeah. That's in player's handbook. I love that. Yeah. yeah. I love that. Yeah. That is awesome. Yeah. That was like, well, I, was like a, a, like a tongue in cheek, but everything's true in player's handbook. That stuff is good information. It is. I mean, it's fascinating. I, I was, I was reading it the other night and I was really, it was very interesting. I thought it was, uh, yeah, most definitely very, uh, and, you know, uh, and I, I dropped the ball in selling it and promoting it because I was just, my head space was not in the right space right then. Mm-hmm. I just really dropped the ball on promoting that one. Totally dropped the ball. But, I mean, I, I did a small, I, small run. I only printed like 10,000 copies and I think I sold like 8,000 of them or something. Yeah. But, you know, that's not, you know, I should have done a big run and promoted it properly and did all that, but I just, you know, dropped the ball. It's easy to do. I get that. I get that. It's it's like you, uh, yeah, the initial, I, I I have a problem with stuff like that and I get all geeked up about it and then it's sort of like now i got to follow through with all the other stuff I don't want to do and that's what Yeah, I had a, a drug problem and getting high and I can't still want to do a book signing if I'm high and, you know, all that. Yeah. yeah. I don't uh, want to go on TV. I'm on drugs. I just don't want to, you know, do all that. <laughs> so, okay, so you finished with Heidi Ware and then you, I mean, what, what, so that was it? He kicked you out and that was the end of it? You, he evicted? I forgot what happened. I quit paying rent or something like that, you know. So I everything forgot. just got, just got uh, sold off and... and... No, I, I after that, I opened up a, a sex. I want to. Oh, I saw like I just tested in that Hollywood Boulevard. I was like, I don't want to work anymore. I just, I just I wanted just to be on autopilot. So, with so like porno stuff, porno stuff. Uh-huh. You know? So I opened up like a sex place on Kawanga. Right off Hollywood Boulevard. It was in between um, Sunset and Hollywood. Okay. Um, but um, so, so I opened up the porn stuff so it would just run on autopilot because I was. Um, what happened was a company in Australia hired. Well, I had that store hired me to. Um, they were putting a brothel on the stock market in Australia, so they hired me to launch it, and they paid me a lot of money, a half million dollars to launch it, and. Um, Promoted that brothel. I thought I'm going back in the sex business. I can't take this anymore. I need to go back. Go back and make some money. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I thought I'll move to Nevada and um, and get back in the sex business. So that's what happened. And then that didn't work out. The, the Nevada no, thing. No, no, no. This is what happened. When I moved to Nevada, I was doing all my research and stuff. And Dennis was like, "Can you?" There was this. 
the, the pimp that owned all these brothels outside of Las Vegas. He goes, get Joe Richards to sell you his places for a million dollars each. He owned like three or four, three brothels. So I moved to Nevada, and then I rent a house next door to me. That was a lady who used. She was a former madam. What a weird thing that I have just by chance moved next to a bedridden madam who used to run the Tropicana Hotel when they had an exotic bird show. And so she had all these birds, Now, and that's why I have the birds. So once I got into the birds, I had no interest in the sex business because these birds, I hate when people say, oh, Heidi's trying to help the birds. No, I'm not trying to um, feed or help birds. These birds that have to sit in a cage where they live the same, how old are you? Uh, 57, 58. Okay, what if you had to spend your 58 years in a bathroom, in a little closet? You wouldn't like that, would you? No, no. I, I, I really. What I thought was uh, brought it home to me was when you said, "I'm not, I'm not trying to raise birds. I'm not, not I'm not trying to preserve birds. I just wanted to be happy." And uh, and that, that was really. Yeah. Well, these birds that are stuck in these rescues and sanctuaries, they're not rescues or sanctuaries if they have to sit in that cage until they die. Yeah. You are not a rescue, yeah. and you are not a sanctuary. You, you know what? Just because it's clean and you give them food, same with people in um, Supermax prison. It's clean and they get food. And to lock them up and throw away the key till they die is wrong. It's ignorant and it totally infiltrated society so people think it's acceptable and it's not. And somebody has to try and stand up to it and change it. It's not fair. And, and people discount it because they're birds. It's wrong. And somebody has to stand up to this ignorant practice. Do you think that, I mean, if you, if you were, if you could wave a magic wand and so you said, uh, you know, to, to, to something you could do for the birds today, would, you, would it be open up the cages and let them all go? My ultimate goal would be every state has one place when people no longer want them, they can drop them off at like a park and they can live out their life free. Mm -hmm. That's not asking a whole lot, you know. And yes, yeah, food and shelter be provided. But yeah, if I have one wish left on this earth, what could it to do? And it would be to help every bird that's rotting inside of a cage. Mm -hmm. If I could think, if that, if one wish, if you have one thing on this earth that you could do, that would be what I, that would be my choice. It wouldn't be to help the poor people or starving people or women's rights or gay rights or anything like that. It would be to help these birds that are stuck in these cages till they die. And that's something that you just kind of, what's fascinating, you just kind of, you know, it went and moved with the flow and zigged with the zags and boom, here you are uh, with this, uh, you know, I don't want to say sanctuary, but you've rescued these things. Uh, those video, those yeah. videos, the video you sent me of them just flying freely was really, really something to see. And then crawling on the trees and uh, yeah, was when really. When you see that in person, it, it, it does something inside you. It's really moving. You feel good. But if yeah. you walk through the rescue sanctuary and they're locked in those cages, you feel creeped out. And that's why people spend $30,000 to go on those guided trips around the equator where you see them flying in their own habitat because you feel good when you see them. It's really majestic and it's in, it makes you, it's inspiring to see it. And it, it feels really, you know, like just a few minutes ago when you heard them screaming like that, I'm like, I think to myself, why the, why am I doing this? Oh my God, it's so horrible. But, but then I'll look up and see them flying like the video I sent you and that's why I'm doing it because that feels so good to do that. <sighs> No, it's really hard. I, I can imagine. I mean, it's, you're, it's like you against the world in a way, and you and the birds against it the world. It is. It's really, really hard. And I just came to the – I mean, it's been a long journey, and I just came to the realization it doesn't matter how much I vocalize it or how many videos I show, I will never, ever get anywhere unless I – lead by example where people can come and see them flying. So I have to move close to Los Angeles or Palm Springs or Las, closer to Las Vegas where people can actually come over and see. And that's the only way I'll get people behind them, this movement is by when people can experience it. Like Disney World, um, they're 
Animal Kingdom, the highlight yeah. of the show, winged encounters, is when the macaws, all the macaws come flying out overhead free, flying. And it's the highlight because it makes people feel good. Because they're a business. They don't care about the birds, but they know it makes people feel good. That's why they do it. So right now I'm in that transition phase where I have to figure out how I can make this work and be closer to where you know, uh, wealthier people and I could, more people can come experience it and, and help change this ignorant thing. Because it so is when you, against the world. You really nailed that. <laughs> how, how do, so when people want to uh, uh, reach out to you and donate to you, to you and to, to help up with the upkeep and, and, uh, and uh, how, how would they get in touch with you? Oh, to go to my YouTube channel. I, I did no. I found I found it myself. Yeah, I will link yeah, it to I, this uh, to yeah. this interview yeah, and that also would be great. Definitely, Thank you. definitely. But how many of macaws do you have with you that you that are in your you know <laughs> orbit? Listen, one one is too many. They're horrible. <laughs> That's why people <laughs> discard them. They're just so horrible. You got to watch one of my diaries and you'll see how horrible they are. <laughs> <laughs> but um, one is too many, and I have over thirty. Oh my gosh! I have over thirty. Yeah. Ha- have no people cases. brought their Have people brought their birds to you? Oh yeah, and I when people think they're doing me a favor, like I have something for you, I'm giving it to you. Well, you know what? It's not that co- people have think that they're of value. They're of no value. All these rescues and stuff are overflowing with them. Yeah. You know, they're just sit, they're just sitting there in those kids till they die. They have no value. And it's not the cost of the bird anyways. It's the cost of keeping the bird. Like, I give them all pistachio is, is with the, you know, organic, with the shell, almonds, walnuts, hazelnuts, fiber nuts. They get special distilled water, organic fruit, or ve- organic vegetables. I try and make up for the horrors that they had to endure by this time on this earth. It's been so awful to them. They really have it from day one. This animal's just screwed. They're born in that cage, and they'll die in the cage. We give no other option to them. Wow. Well, that's, I mean, that's clearly you're really passionate about it. Something that I thought was interesting is that I, I originally saw you or found you on Cameo. And I was mentioning to a friend, I said, well, I'd like, you know, I'd like to ask Heidi a couple of questions. He said, why don't you just email her, just cut out the middleman. And I thought, well, okay, that makes complete sense. And uh, so if somebody wanted to reach out to you and maybe, you know, if you get a hello from Heidi Fleiss like they would on Cameo, if they went directly to you, it would be probably better better for both of you guys. I'll do, yeah, I'll do anything to help the birds, you know, and of course it takes a lot of money. Yeah, I can imagine. I can't get a job anywhere. No one's going to hire me, you know. <laughs> no one's going to hire me for anything. All right, yeah, well, I mean, you, you certainly, I don't know, there's cachet in being hiding place. There's certainly, uh, uh, you know, if I can make a business drive, around, a business around showing people when people died, there's hope for everybody. <laughs> oh, that's funny. That is so funny. Well, well I, I, love, I think it's a great idea, and I could see, you know, the, there is, when people go to Hollywood, when you walk down Hollywood Boulevard, you don't get, you know, you're not seeing Marilyn Monroe getting discovered on the counter. That's for sure. Not anymore. That's for damn sure. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> like I read about that Superman in Hollywood. That how is he? They found him. He got stuck in the barrel at the Goodwill on the clothes bin on Crystal Meth. Yeah, yeah. The Superman dude, and I'm like, oh my God. Well, isn't that typical? These people come to Hollywood. They want to see famous people, so they see that Superman on Crystal Meth who died in the Goodwill bin. <laughs> that, and they, that's why your tours are good because then they do get to see a little Hollywood. You know, I remember growing up in LA, how we would go before we go to a nightclub, we'd go get drunk in Errol Flynn's swimming pool and tell scary stories or something. You know, all, growing up, all those yeah, all those places like that around LA. You know, you go, oh yeah, Lucille Ball lives here. They live here. You know, everyone. That's interesting. Yeah, a lot of people in high school went up to the where Sharon Tate got murdered on like kind of a rite of passage sort. Of thing. Did you ever do that? Uh, no, I never went to that. But look, I was raising my silk right across from where the La Bianca's died. I, um, before, yeah. I, I mean, we live, we live right, but actually the city of Los Angeles, right under the observatory, donated, dedicated a bench to my father, which is really cool. 
actually right under the observatory. It's beautiful. But um, he was a famous doctor. Peter I know, I know exactly who he was. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, and I think it's so cool that the city did that because, you know, like he was a real doctor. He wasn't, you know, just writing prescriptions. He, he had a connection with his patients. And he was in practice so long, by the time he died when he was 80, uh, a lot of his patients grew on to, you know, had important positions. And, for, you know, they were so thankful that they, for my dad, that someone they could talk to and help them through, you know, puberty or whatever. Mm -hmm. and all kinds of stuff. So, yeah, that's really cool. They donated that. that ben Very. Ben. Right. I mean, they even made a movie about your dad, didn't they? Yeah, I'm glad because um, it, I think he got decent money and it paid for a lot of the problems I caused him. Wow. Sounds like a decent guy. And I'm gonna go visit, I'm gonna go look for his bench. I'm gonna go up there and look for his bench. Yeah, I'll send you a picture and everything. That'd be cool. That'd be cool. Um, well, listen, I'm gonna I'm gonna go, but I did want to ask you one more question. And this is I, I keep files forever. You know, I scan shit in from the uh, from the 80s and the 90s. And one of these weird articles I had uh, said that um, you uh, and a guy by the name of Steve Hoffman, who was Michael Jackson's plastic surgeon saved the guy that jumped yeah. off the Santa Monica Pier? Yeah, wasn't that crazy? <laughs> what that was crazy. happened? Yeah, what? that was so crazy. It was, that was like before, I, that was so long ago. It was before I went to prison and it was, at the time, NBC had this, you know, how every, they have the in-house doctor for their news. So they yeah. had their, their in-house doctor was some guy, Dr. Bruce Hensel. So I think we went to like, Sinwa or Spagos of, uh, you know, Santa Monica Spagos. And afterwards, we just went for a walk down the pier. And I think this is Steve Hoffman or one of them was saying, isn't it just the world is so beautiful? I love coming out here. It's so peaceful and calm. But, you know, this, how there used to be a lot of transients out there and stuff. Right when you say how beautiful it is, we just hear this big splash. And some crazy guy, he handcuffed himself together and then jumped off the pier. Wasn't that it was crazy? I just so, ran to the phone and call, called 911. Was it just like a stunt that he was trying to be like Houdini or something? He, he was trying to kill himself. He, oh. he changed his mind when he hit the water. He screamed for help. Oh, for fuck's he, sake. He wanted to kill himself, so he handcuffed himself. But that, then when he hit the water, he wanted help. This is really morbid. I'll just send you of the dearly departed. I read about <laughs> the survivors of the Golden Gate Bridge because there's 2% survived. Yeah. And and of the survivors, all of them said as soon as they left the earth that they were in the air, they regretted their decision. I believe it. I believe it. Yeah. There was, well, yeah, yeah. There was a, I think Netflix did a documentary about that, didn't they? Did they? I don't know. It's called, it's called The Bridge. And I sat through it once, and it was really, I couldn't. I couldn't watch it again, but these guys, oh uh, a film crew, Netflix. <laughs> a film crew had uh, got permission to film the bridge for an entire year. So they, every day they were filming the year, the people that gave them the permission didn't realize, and maybe that's not what they intended to do, but they actually caught a couple of suicides happening and they were able to alert people and uh, either save them or uh, I don't know, but they interviewed all the, you know, the people that survived and they interviewed the family members of the people who didn't. And it's, it's a fascinating, it's called The Bridge, and oh. it's, really, it's really disturbing, but it's really interesting. Yeah, yeah he, you really know have a lot of 411 going on, huh? <laughs> No shit. You have, a, you have a lot of info. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, it wasn't my intention, but it, I appreciate it. And I really, honest to God, I'm going to push your, uh, I'm going to push people coming to your website, and uh, and I think it's important what you're doing. And I and I, it's awesome that you're using your your Heidi Fleissness to bring attention to this. And uh, and you've certainly got a fan in me, and uh, and I'm I will certainly you push understand. it. I'm glad that you understand because a lot of people they can't even understand what I'm doing. It's so hard. They can't see beyond themselves, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's LA. Even it, yeah, it's like, well, okay, I say, they not only do they understand, they're like, well, why would you do that? Why, you know, well, it's not about me, so it must be so hard to understand, you know? <laughs> but so I, I enjoy talking to you, and I will, I'm going to watch the bridge, and I will send you um, my 
it's a parrot diary. And, uh, okay, cool. And when I when I make this video, I, I got about a minute and a half of the footage that what they were filming out there. They're making a movie video or a music video in front of your old place, and it was something about you know that guy, meaning that that guy had the coronavirus sort of head, and uh, and and he's walking down the boulevard, and and everyone walks by and says you to the coronavirus so that it's a music video that's going to come out so you're going to have a cameo it, <laughs> but um okay. well listen okay so I'll, I'll i'll um i'll let you know when this goes uh on and i sure appreciate your time heidi and it's been a real sure. it's been fun chatting with you thank you sure maybe we'll have lunch or something one day i'd love that i would okay. all right awesome take care have a great night bye. you too bye-bye what prompted me to do this interview with Heidi uh, were these boxer shorts that I showed you at the beginning of the video. Now, what I didn't focus on was the inscription, Mary, thank you, Heidi Fleiss. Mary was a friend of ours at Dearly Departed Tours, one of our most favorite people who's been coming to take the tour with her granddaughter, Kara, for many years. And, and Mary gave me these boxer shorts as well as many books and posters over the years and just a lot of love and support. And after I did this interview with Heidi, uh, sadly, Mary passed away. So I want to dedicate this video to Mary and rest in peace and to Kara as well. I hope you're well, dear. Um, now, I've got to pay the bills still, so I'm going to thank the people that support this page, uh, the Patreons of this page. I know a lot of people call them patrons. I prefer Patreon because I think it's a cool word and I like it. So thank you very much to... Um, to D. Rogers, to Mark Draskovics, Suzanne McGuire Phillips, Gerald Fordham, Lynette Simpson, Smirsh Pod, Ken Brown, Elizabeth, Candy Lacays, Cindy Struder, Becky Bradley, Ty Halbeck, John Fritz, Monica Wooten Kelly, Slash's Hat, Angie Sharp, and Marcy. Thank you so much for supporting the page. The link is below and uh, so is the PayPal link. I appreciate it. And most importantly, uh, God bless you, Mary Noble. Uh, we will miss you dearly. You heard me.